Cool. Well, I'll go ahead and get started here um, and, and just jump right in, really. Uh, by way of, of quick introduction, this little session that we'll do today is going to focus entirely on using your smartphone to capture video clips that could be really useful in a lot of different ways. It could be useful in a, a short video that gets put together and shared as a standalone piece. Uh, the clips could be useful as little supplemental material, maybe just a short clip that gets played during um, a presentation or, or a webinar. Uh, and so there's a, there's a wide variety of things that we can uh, that we can use these video clips for. So I think all of the tips and, 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 t and tricks that I'm going to suggest to you today apply no matter what the intent. So the first thing that I want to make sure that I go over with you guys real quick, I'm going to introduce you to maybe a, a new word. It's one of my favorite words. Um, it's IntelliKey. And uh, if you have never heard of it, it's a philosophy term. It means the realization of potential. And I like to introduce all of these presentations that I give. Um, I've, I've given presentations like this to tourism organizations all around the country, to Fortune 500 companies uh, all over the world. And uh, one thing that I know for sure is that I can give you every tip, every trick known to man, um, and you can have them in your head, um, but if if you don't decide in your mind that it's it's not that hard and that you can do it and, and go ahead and, and get your camera out and try uh, and know that probably the first few times you do this, it may not be that great. And, and you and you work through that and you learn, um, then you're not going to be able to use any of the things that are going to follow. So I would just encourage you to kind of make up in your mind, like I'm either going to be one of these folks that goes out and collects this video and, and makes it useful for all the different things that we can do through these trainings. Um, or, or maybe I'm not, and that's okay too. Um, but I think the, like many things like exercise and diet and so many other things in our lives, the, the first and, and most important thing that you can do is decide that you're going to put some of this into practice and sort of realize the potential. Um, because like I said, everything else that I share with you after this won't matter a whole lot unless, uh, unless you make that decision in your mind. So the first thing, the first real tip, though, that I want to share with you is to be clear on the purpose that you're setting out to accomplish. So why are you going to capture any video at the location uh, where, where you are today? Or, or uh, why would somebody be able to understand the message that's going to be communicated using the video that you're going to capture? And this is actually um, pretty easy to, to do. And, and I, I encourage people to just spend five, 10 minutes uh, writing down or, or maybe jotting it down on a note on your phone or even just doing a mental exercise of going through this sort of fill in the blank statement. The people who watch this video will what? What is their reaction going to be? And, and I encourage you to think about is there a, is this a, 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 like an informational thing where they'll learn something? The people who watch this video will learn or will know, fill in the blank. Or, or is it a, a feeling? The people who watch this video will feel this way. Or the people who watch this video will do, will they take a certain action? And then because I show and tell them, blank, you fill in that blank. What is it that you're going to film? What are you going to, what kind of clips are you going to create or photos are you going to take? that will help to cause that reaction. It's a simple cause and, and effect or action reaction kind of statement. Uh, what this will allow you to do though, is to make sure that what you're recording helps to fulfill the purpose. If, if you want people to stop doing a certain practice that, that isn't helpful or isn't effective, you wanna think about that before you go out and start filming clips because Every clip that you record either will or will not have an effect on whether or not people will truly stop doing that practice. And so you can kind of filter. You can use it as a filter to decide, well, is this, you know, where I'm aiming my camera right now, is this helpful to show people why we shouldn't do that practice anymore? Uh, or do I need to get a little closer so people can really see the, the, the effect, the, the reason why we shouldn't do this practice? It will help you to think about and make sure that the clips that you're recording are actually relevant and useful for the purpose of the video. Next, uh, I encourage people to scout 
a location. Uh, there's this is actually, you know, scouting location scouting is, is a term in, in film and in video and, and television production. Uh, and if people have, have been doing it long enough and, and doing it enough that they've given it a, a name and, and the people are very familiar with the idea or the concept of scouting a location, then it's probably something that uh, anybody who's going to record video should think about, should pay attention to. And so this picture was actually taken um, during a, a location scout. Um, Grant, who is on, on our on our call today too, and uh, and one of our other colleagues went out for a video shoot that we actually partnered with with Scott and Jill on, and uh, we arrived about a half an hour early before any of the people uh, that we were going to be filming before any of the other folks arrived, and we just spent time walking around and making sure that we understood where everything was, where the best angles might be. Uh, where the sun was going to be when we were there that day to make sure that we weren't going to be, you know, shooting directly into the sun or, or anything like that. And just walking around and making sure that we got a good lay of the land before we started recording anything really informed a lot of the decisions that we made about where and when and how we would record the clips we were going to record. So I think that um, I've seen people just kind of get somewhere and then think to themselves, like, yeah, I know I need to record some videos. So they just end up pushing the record button and then walking around and sort of discovering things as they're recording. And while that could be okay, if you were filming like a documentary and we had, you know, an hour and a half to work with in, <laughs> in content, uh, most of the time that's not going to be the case here. And what we're going to want is short, concise clips that really reinforce that purpose that we talked about just a minute ago. And so scouting the location and making sure that you get the lay of the land before you even start recording will really help in making sure that what you get is, is gonna have the biggest bang for, for the buck, so to speak. This one seems kind of, uh, <laughs> this has nothing to do with creativity or, or quality of video, but it's super important, especially if you have not done a lot of video recording in the past, you may be shocked to find out how quickly your storage will become full on your phone. And if also you're one of those folks, like so, so many of us that don't make a habit out of uh, removing photos and videos from your phone on a regular basis, uh, you'll find that your storage becomes full very quickly, and then you could be out. And, and I've done this. Um, I'm I'm a veteran at this. I've been I've been recording videos on my phone since you could do it. Um, and <laughs> there will still be times when I'm on vacation with my family or when I'm out somewhere and I'm in the middle of recording, and I get the alert that I'm run out of space. And so I would encourage you if you're going to go out and you're going to shoot video or you're going to take a lot of photos, make it a habit to regularly, uh, it could be just monthly, maybe even for you, it could be, could be quarterly, um, but just make it a habit to plug your phone into your computer and move a bunch, if not all of those clips and, and photos that you wanna save onto your computer, uh, onto Dropbox, somewhere where you can uh, store them long-term. And you don't have to worry about running out of space when you're out on a video shoot because there's nothing worse than um, <laughs> being proud of yourself for remembering, okay, I got to get this video clip because this is a really good example. And then all of a sudden you go to hit record and you've got no space left. Um, so just think about that, especially, like I said, if you're one of those folks um, who, uh, when this alert comes up, it's normally an indicator that it's time for you to buy a new phone. <laughs> that is, that's not, <laughs> not the practice that you want to, that you want to put into, into play here. You want to make sure that you're getting stuff off of your phone and, uh, and, and freeing up the space so that when, you, when you're out and about, you've got plenty of it. Because video takes up a lot more space than, than photos or text messages or anything else on your phone. Sort of similarly, another kind of boring one, but one that may, uh, may be more important than some of the more creative ones we'll get to later is uh, the battery life on your device. Uh, once again, if you're not used to filming videos uh, or using uh, the camera app on your phone uh, very actively, you'll probably be surprised to find out how quickly your phone battery will, will drain and will die uh, when you're out using that camera app. The camera app uh, takes an awful lot of, of battery life from your, from your device. So 
Um, there are a few ways that you can make sure that you've got plenty of juice. One is to just make sure that you've got your camera fully charged or your phone, I should say, fully charged before you go out and do any recording. Um, that could also mean having a car charger available. I know a lot of you folks, uh, maybe all of you, uh, are you know driving a truck to the to the site, and you could make sure that you've got your phone plugged in if that's not an, a habit already for you, um, so that it's charging while you're on your way to a site. And that way, when you get out, you've got a full charge, um, and and you don't run into an issue where you're in the middle of recording something and your and your battery is dead. Uh, another way to do this, uh, maybe not entirely necessary for you, but uh, you may have you may have found this to be useful already in your personal life uh, or your professional life. I carry, I have one in my car. I just have an extra um, portable charger that I can keep with me. Uh, it's also become a lifesaver on vacations and things like that. And in scenarios where if you're going to be out all day on a job site uh, and you maybe don't have access to go back and, and plug in uh, your phone to uh, a charger in your vehicle or or into an outlet, having one of those portable battery packs uh, can be really handy for some extra juice in case your uh, your phone dies while you're out wanting to get some video clips. Now this one, I want to do a little quiz, uh, and we're not gonna you don't have to to turn your your audio back on or anything like that. I just want you to take a moment and process this for a second. Horizontal video, hey, yep. Hey, Rocky, just to interject real quick, yep. I, there's, at least for me, there's a short delay uh, in the uh, slide flipping over. Um, it's not problematic yet, but just so you can be aware. Yeah, thanks for the heads up. That way I don't yep. give any spoilers. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, so so this is a, an exercise. Hopefully you can see it now on the screen. We've got horizontal video and vertical video. I just want you to take a second and ask yourself, which one of these should I be recording <laughs> in? Which which style or which format should I be recording in? And if you answered horizontally, you are correct. Uh, for most of what you're gonna wanna do out on a job site or for the types of clips that we're gonna be looking for and, and using on social media and in other places, you're gonna wanna use horizontal video. Vertical video, although it's the way that you're used to holding your phone 90% of the time, and it's a little bit more convenient to hold it that way, uh, you need to understand that if you're capturing video in that format, it cannot be rotated and used in a horizontal format, which is the way that most of us are used to watching videos. Uh, so you want to make sure that you're holding your phone horizontally when you uh, are shooting any kind of video clips. Um, it's also kind of... For, for a lot of what you all are doing, since you're out in, in nature and out in, in landscape environments, um, even shooting photos in horizontal is the most advantageous because we can use those photos more easily in video clips. Um, as you're probably all aware, 99.9% .9 of presentations, like the one I'm giving today, uh, if you'll notice, the screen is horizontal. Um, same thing with any PowerPoint presentations at an event or a training. And so photos, images uh, are, are more useful in that horizontal format. There are certainly cases where vertical and, and portrait uh, works better, um, but for 99% of what you all are, are gonna be doing and capturing horizontal is, is the way to go. And I also do wanna let you know that I straight up stole this uh, image from the internet. And so if you are one of those very uh, detail-oriented person and you've noticed already that landscape is misspelled, I want you to know I did not type that. I would not allow that. <laughs> and I, I would have I would have fixed it myself uh, had I not just swiped this right off the internet. So next, uh, trying to pause a little bit here for effect and to make sure the screen loads for you. Um, it's pretty important to stabilize your video shots whenever you can. Um, there's there's not really a more telltale sign of amateur video or uh, maybe low quality video than uh, seeing a shaky camera shot or, or a shot where uh, there's there's a lot of sort of unintentional and unnecessary movement. Um, one of the probably go to uh, ways to record video and you can kind of picture this in your head is you just sort of stand there with the, the phone at eye level or kind of right in front of your face as you're looking at the at the camera 
and then just kind of walking around or, or holding the, the camera or the phone at eye level and, and sort of showing the same thing that your eyes would be seeing. Um, just kind of, we call this a POV or a point of view shot. Um, it's kind of a go-to and it works for family get togethers and birthday parties and things like that. But it's, it's sort of the, the least impactful way to communicate using video. And so what I would encourage you to do is instead of just holding your phone out in front of you and doing that POV shot is to find ways to stabilize your shot. Whether that's like this picture here that I've got is a, a phone that's been mounted to a tripod using a, a tripod adapter, which are readily available. You can um, search Amazon uh, or, or I don't know um, if, if Scott and the team have uh, some of these in their in their kits or or if you all have some of these in your kits uh, where, where you work, where you can actually take your tripod if you have one uh, and, and the tripod adapter and, and attach your phone to something like a tripod uh, or, or, or kind of set it on a stable surface, whether that's on, I've, I've taken pictures and taken videos just having my phone set on the back of a, you know, on the bed of a, a flatbed truck or on the top of a, of a, a cone, a construction cone. Um, it's, it's certainly anything goes, like kind of be, be, a, be an engineer a bit with what you've got around you. And, and the idea is to stabilize your, your shot to make sure there's not a lot of unnecessary hand movement with, uh, with, your, with your phone. Um, and, and I'm going to break that rule in just a minute, but, but I just want to tell you that um, if your choice is to hold the camera with your hand right in front of your face and sort of not really provide any intentional movement, which again, we'll talk about in a moment, but, but if the movement is going to be unintentional because of shaky hands or because of you just kind of walking around, if that's your choice versus setting the camera down somewhere and getting a nice stable shot, I would choose nine times out of 10, the, the stable shot, whether that's on again, a tripod or, or something that you've sort of engineered. And that again, just helps to remove some of that shakiness from your hands. And it helps to sort of force you to think more about what you're putting in the frame of, of the shot rather than just doing that point of view, walking around, showing people what they would see if they were there, which uh, most of the time results in a, in a, in a lot of longer, um, less useful, um, sort of candidly more boring uh, shots. Now, I'm, again, I'm going to break the rule and I don't know how well you'll be able to see the video that's playing in the background here. This is actually not a, a photo or a still image. There's a, a video playing. My guess is that you won't be able to see the movement real well because as we do these things over the Internet, they tend to not be um, the best uh, quality <laughs> in terms of being able to to watch a video. I'll just I'll just play it again. But there's a few sequences of movement in here. There's three shots and they all three have some different kinds of movement. And so what I'll do is I'll just play each one real quick and pause it in the middle. So that we can see, here's the first one. I'll pause it. And if you're not able to see, what's happening here is the grass that's in front of the camera is moving quite a bit with the wind, with the breeze. And what I want you to notice though, if you can, or I'll just tell you if you can't, there's no movement of the camera at all. We have this set on a tripod, like I've described. Uh, we don't, we're not holding it with our hands. We just, we just have it set, and the only movement that's happening on the screen is the grass in front of us, which provides a lot of visual interest. It puts the focus on the movement on the grass. And then um, if you could see the detail, which, again, I sincerely doubt uh, over the Internet, you can see the, the ripples in the uh, in the wetland back behind that grass um, it's it's uh, pretty pretty noticeable and in high definition you've got all these ripples from the wind in that water uh, back in, in the background and so that's one form of movement that you can get when you're filming video so i want you to think about there's there's basically three kinds of of movement that you can provide and movement is very very important now before when i was talking about stabilizing your shot i'm talking about movement that's not very intentional a movement that doesn't really add a lot which is you know your hand movement of just kind of shaking the camera around or or moving the camera around sort of unnecessarily but there are three kinds of movement that are actually very good and purposeful and this is one of them this is a scenario where the camera isn't moving 
but what's in the scene is providing a lot of movement. There's a lot of movement in that grass as the wind blows through it. And so you can think about that when you're filming out there. Think about, is my subject, is what I've put on camera already providing a lot of movement? And if it is, then your camera probably doesn't need to move at all. You can just film the movement of, of maybe water moving through a certain area or maybe uh, uh, machinery being used. Maybe the, whatever the subject is, is already providing a lot of movement. The next clip is a really, really low shot moving through some of this grass. And, and what, you, what you hopefully noticed uh, in this shot is that mostly the camera is moving in this scenario. So this is a scenario where, yeah, the grass is moving a little bit, but mostly the grass is moving because we're moving the camera through it. And so that's another one that you can think about, where if you think about if I'm, uh, if I'm showing a, a subject in my, in my camera, in my, in my frame, I'm looking on my phone and I'm seeing what's there, and there's really not a lot happening, there's not a lot of movement, well, that's not a whole heck of a lot different than just taking a picture. So if we're going to use video to its kind of max, if we're going to make sure we take advantage of, of video to the max, and, and we don't really have a, uh, a lot of movement happening with the subject, then we can add camera movement. And this is where moving the camera with your hand uh, can be actually very purposeful and be very helpful. So in this particular shot that I was showing, we moved the camera through the grass to provide some movement that wasn't really there if we had just set it completely still. And then finally, the last one, I'll play through this one so you can see that movement. The last one provides an example of really two things at once. And it's a wide shot, so you might not be able to see the movement very well. But the grass, again, is moving with the wind quite substantially. There's a lot of movement happening with the grass in this. But because it's so far away, you don't notice it as well as you did in that first shot. So what we also did, and I'll play it while I finish up, the tip here is, oh, my button disappeared. There we go. What we also did in that shot was we moved the camera. We did what's called a pan, and we panned the camera from left to right. And you can do that on a tripod. You can do it uh, with your hands. You can just hold the camera and aim sort of all the way to the left and then move the, the camera, move your phone with your hand to the right and provide that panning effect. That's different than a POV or a point of view shot where you're just kind of walking around and showing whatever you're looking at and kind of moving the camera to, you know, this would be like the, the equivalent of you just sort of standing there and turning your head all the way. You look to the left and then you just turn your head and look to the right. And so I'll just play that again really, really quick just through here so that you can see that movement, which is both camera movement and with the movement of the grass, we've got subject movement as well. Just play it one more time. Because if nothing else, when you watch this, if you watch the recording, you'll be able to see it. And so the timing of all of those clips, you'll, you'll, you may notice we actually, I actually took this sequence of three shots directly out of a video of talking about Indiana's wetlands that we, that we partnered with Scott and Jill to make. Um, the sequence of these three shots, unedited, I pulled right out of that video. So that, that's how we use them in the finished piece. And so it's only four or five seconds. I'm having to replay it over and over again, actually, because it's so short to demonstrate my point. But in the video, in the finished video, it's only three or four seconds. So for you out and about filming, you might, you might just do these movement shots uh, or even the stabilized shots for 10 seconds, 15 seconds at the most. We don't need, uh, usually it's, it's very rare that we need uh, somebody walking around for a minute or two with the camera just filming kind of everything that they see for a minute or two. It's, it's, it's very rare that those kinds of shots are helpful. In fact, they can be really difficult to sort through because we end up with so much content in editing that we don't know where the needle in the haystack is. So if you're very purposeful, if you're thinking again, back to our purpose statement at the beginning, you're thinking very purposeful about where you're aiming the camera and you're adding either movement of the camera or movement of the subject or sometimes movement of both the camera and the subject only for 8 to 10, 15 seconds at, at the most, you're going to provide a lot of those really great short B-roll clips that are very useful in presentations or in videos like, like the one that I took this from. 
The next one, uh, which I've accidentally clicked through to a couple of times here. Sorry about that. The next one is a, a thing I want you to practice. If you're in a position right now where you can actually get your phone out and open up the camera app, I want you to try this because it's a feature on your phone's camera app that a lot of people don't even know exists. And it's built right in. It's not something that's difficult to use. I want you to get your phone out and open up the camera app. And if you're in a place uh, where you can move the, the camera around, so, so, you know, with the camera app open, and, and it can be with, uh, with photo or video setting, but it's probably best since we're talking mainly about video here to, to switch the camera app to your video setting so that you, you could be recording video here in a moment. But, uh, but you don't have to record anything. Just, just move your camera around to focus on different things, especially move it towards, uh, like if you're in your vehicle, like this is, or if you're in an office, move the camera from like your window, like show what's outside your window to something inside your truck or inside your office. Dramatic lighting changes affect your, your camera app quite a bit because what's happening as you move, you may notice What's happening is your what's on your screen, what's what's in your 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 frame, is changing in brightness automatically. It's uh, it's an auto exposure setting that is just, it's actually normally it's very helpful. It's it's helping your camera automatically adjust to the appropriate level of exposure or brightness, if you will, for the the environment that you're in. The tricky thing though is that if the lighting changes as you move your camera around or as the sun goes in and out behind a cloud or something that auto exposure changes while you're recording and it can be really annoying and so just because it's pretty easy to get to uh and it, and it helps the quality of your video immensely go to one of those places put one of those things in frame that i mentioned like take your the inside of of your truck or your 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 office and just keep that in frame for a second. And, and like the picture that I've shown here, put your thumb or your finger on the screen, tap something on the screen and just hold down for a moment. I think it takes about three or four seconds. Hold down on the screen and this little pop-up should, should show. And if you have an iPhone or if you have an Android, it, it may be different, but it'll probably say AE slash AF lock. And normally if I'm giving this presentation live, that's where like I hear an audible, oh, in the room because people don't know that this even exists. But you can actually lock the exposure and lock the focus so that then if now if you've got that locked and you move your camera around, like if you move it back out to the bright sunlight or if you move it from from a, a place where it's a little darker to a place where it's a little brighter, you're not going to see that automatic adjustment. You're not going to see that that brightness increasing or decreasing as you move your camera around, which can be really, really handy for scenes when you're out and there might be a difference from, you know, from from one place to another, especially if you're practicing any of those movement shots that I was just showing you a moment ago. Uh, you're, you don't want to see the auto exposure or the auto focus adjusting uh, on your camera while you're recording the clip. Now, if you didn't, if you didn't get your phone out and you didn't do that live or didn't practice that live, that may not mean a whole lot to you. Um, just to quickly summarize, when you're in your camera app, um, you basically open up the video uh, function and you hold, you tap, you put your finger on the, the screen where you want to focus and you hold long enough for that little pop-up to, to occur and that'll auto lock your, or that'll lock your, your exposure and your autofocus. And then when uh, the next time you uh, you close or reopen your camera app, it, it will refresh. It'll, it'll be gone. So you don't have to worry about unlocking it. That just happens automatically. Next, I want to talk about rule of thirds. Now, if you've ever taken a photography class uh, or, or a video class or anything like that, uh, or even maybe a design class of any kind, um, you, you've probably heard of this. This is not something that's unique to video. This, uh, this concept of rule of thirds, basically, if you look at the screen here, I've got uh, a close-up shot of some uh, lovely spider wart. Um, it's actually a close-up shot from the same place uh, that I, I showed you that picture earlier where, where I talked about scouting the location. Um, so this is a good example of, of, a, of a wide shot and a tight shot, which we'll talk about in a moment. But 
if you look at this shot, it's framed in such a way where the spider wart flower is not in the center of the screen. Uh, if you sort of picture those blue lines, if you kind of imagine those always on the the frame uh, or what you're seeing in your uh, in your camera's uh, viewfinder, if you imagine those blue lines dividing your screen into thirds, both horizontally and vertically, basically putting a tic-tac-toe board. Usually we say that the most interesting place to put your subject is on the cross sections of those lines on the third of the screen. This sort of goes back to um, something, something I was talking about earlier where like if we just shoot everything uh, from our point of view, like if we just shoot everything centered and plain and kind of how we approach life where like right now my laptop as I'm presenting to you is centered in front of me. It's kind of how we tend to do things uh, it's kind of our default. We put everything right in the middle, right? And that, that's kind of how, like, you know, if you were to film, if you were, to, if I were to tell you to go out and take a picture of this spider wart, your first inclination might be to just to center it in in the camera's frame and to take a picture. And that's okay. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. But the rule of thirds tells us that to add interest, to make things a little more interesting, and to provide variety. We can think about framing things up so that the interesting part of our picture or our video is on the cross section of these third lines. And I'll show you a few examples. First of all, there's the spider wart. Um, now, I will I will tell you that the the what's in focus at the moment, the dew drops on the spider wart is, is center frame. But because this is a video, if I were to play it for you, you would see that the focus would change from those dew drops to the actual flower back in the background there. Uh, and, and, and thereby putting the, the main focus of this shot in that, that section, that cross section of the rule of thirds. Here's another example uh, out in another wetland where we have the dragonfly over on the left third. So if you can kind of imagine if I can um, kind of flip back and forth between the two of these, if you're watching a video, for example, and, and your eye is over here looking kind of toward the right at that, that spider wart flower, and then uh, we switch. And then all of a sudden, the thing that's most interesting is over on the left. It's kind of, it's almost like uh, aerobics for your eyes. <laughs> and we're changing the, the location of where the most interesting thing is in frame. And I'll do it again. And then down sort of in the bottom third of this image, we have the, uh, the tractor and, and the farmer uh, down there uh, in, in the bottom third. And then this example, the final one I want to show you is uh, breaking the rule of thirds, because as many of us know, uh, sometimes the rules are meant to be broken, and that's perfectly fine. This is a, a boardwalk uh, out at um, Scott Starling. Uh, 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 I think it's Scott Starling. Uh, Scott could correct me. Scott, not Starling. Scott Miner could correct me if I'm wrong. But um, we were out filming this boardwalk being made, and uh, because of the nature of the boardwalk and, and just kind of the interesting sort of leading line of setting the camera down, the camera is actually set right down on top of the boardwalk. Um, it sort of breaks the rule of thirds in a really nice way where it's just interesting that the, the lines kind of point right directly toward the screen, toward the, the folks that are out there putting together uh, the boardwalk on the other end of the shot. And so that's not to say that every single thing you shoot needs to be set up so that it's like these examples where we've put them on the, the cross sections and, that, and following that rule of thirds. Sometimes you want to break the rule and that's perfectly fine as well. But I think what we're, our main point here is don't just do the same thing over and over and over again. Don't uh, just center everything up over and over and over again because um, inherently sort of our, our go-to would be to center things in the frame. Uh, we do want to mix it up and put things in different parts of the, of the frame. Uh, next, I want to talk about another way to get variety in, um, not only using the rule of thirds and using movement, but talking about uh, wide, medium, and tight shots. And these are three different um, types of shots that are based on how close we are to our subject. And I want to I want to point out at the beginning here that it's important when you think about wide, medium, and tight shots that most of the time it's really, really helpful and effective to get a wide, a medium, and a tight shot of the same exact thing. So it's not just mixing up and getting a variety of, of and I'll, I know I'll show you the example of what I mean by wide, medium, and tight in a moment if you don't already know, but um, it's, not, it's not just mixing it up and getting a variety 
across the board of all the different things that you might be capturing. But it's oftentimes it's really important to get a wide, medium and tight shot of the same thing because you can see different details. You can learn different things about your subject from the different wide, medium and tight angles. And so I'll give you an example of this in photo form. Um, this is an example. I, I love this. I think I've been using it for like five, six years. Um, but this is a, a shot that I took on vacation uh, with my family out um, in uh, just uh, the southern part of Michigan. And um, I want you to think about what you can tell from this angle. This would be a wide shot, as in I'm standing back quite a ways away from them. And the angle that I'm seeing is a very wide one, as in I can see a lot of different things. And so from this shot, I can tell things like what the weather was like, what kind of a day it was, you know, partly cloudy, um, probably a nice, a nice day. Um, I can tell it's obviously the season. It's not the dead of winter, for example. Um, I can tell that there, there aren't a lot of people around. This is a, you know, a fairly peaceful kind of environment. I get a lot of feeling, uh, kind of big picture feeling um, observations from a wide shot, right? But I can't specifically tell what these folks are doing, especially if I've not done this activity before. I may be clueless as to why these folks, my, why my, what my family is, is doing out here. So if I bump up to a, a medium shot, which is something that's certainly closer, but not exactly a, a super, super close shot, I'm now focused on just one of my characters and I can see much more closely what he's doing. This is my oldest son, Caspian. And at this point, I can now tell that he's picking blueberries right? And then if I go even tighter and I get uh, what, what I would consider to be a, a per picture perfect example of a close-up shot or a very tight shot, I could tell you, I could start to tell you the story of how that particular day Caspian, my oldest, wanted to find the biggest blueberry out of our whole family. And that was his, you know, I have three sons. So that was his competitive nature coming out. And this was the biggest blueberry that he found that day. And what you'll notice is that I can very easily start to tell quite a specific story about Caspian and about my family once I start getting into these finer details. Um, it's, it's much less interesting if I tell you that Caspian, my oldest son, wanted to find the biggest blueberry uh, while we were picking blueberries if, if this was the only picture I had to, to work with, right? This wide shot. I, 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 okay, if I look at the wide shot, I can tell, oh, okay, well, they were out there picking blueberries, but I don't I can't tell which of those people is Caspian. It's too far away. I can't tell that you're picking blueberries. I can't tell the size of any of the blueberries from this picture. So the importance of getting that wide, medium, and tight tells us a lot of different details from different perspectives. So you might be able to show a wide shot of an area to give people context, to tell people what all is going on in this area. Where are we? We're, we're on, a, on a construction site or we're out uh, at, at a different, you know, at a, we're, at, you know, out exploring uh, stormwater and, uh, in, in a different area. Maybe it's not construction. Um, and, and, and it's important to see the context. Has it been raining a lot? Is there a lot of water in the shot, in the wide shot? Can I see a lot of movement of water in the, in the wide shot? Is it still raining? I may be able to tell that from a wide shot. But then if I get down more closely into a medium or even a tight shot, I may be able to communicate details that might have been missed by the wider shot. I might be able to show where water is specifically going, uh, what is in that water uh, that maybe I wouldn't have been able to see from the wider shot. Uh, and so important details might be entirely missed if I only shoot from one angle or one location. And then finally, my last tip, tip number 11, which is kind of a bonus tip. Um, there's a, a term in film production. Uh, it actually goes back to, uh, to when film was being, uh, was being used in, in all movie and, and television uh, productions. Uh, nowadays, of course, the camera even that I have there from the filming of, of a documentary that, that we shot uh, doesn't use film. But, but the term, check the gate, comes from when we did use film. Uh, when the film would roll through the, the camera, uh, things would sometimes collect there. There would be little bits of, of film fragments or there would be hair or dust that sometimes would collect in the camera itself. And sometimes those little pieces of dust or hair or, or film fragments would actually land between the lens and the film as the film is rolling through the camera. And so the gate 
uh, on the basically the, the the back of the camera or where they would open it up and 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 look inside uh, the term check the gate comes from the action of actually opening up the gate and and checking after the film has rolled through maybe the the director has said cut oh i love that one that one's perfect that's exactly what i want and you know some pa goes check the gate and they open up the back um and and they look to make sure that between the lens and where the camera uh, the film was rolling through there isn't anything that would obstruct or would have ruined the shot because it doesn't matter how much the director liked it if there was a big old nasty chunk of something uh between the lens and the film that shot isn't going to be used isn't going to be useful it's going to have been ruined so they're going to have to to reshoot um or if the gate was clean the 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 person checking would would yell the gate is clean and they would move on and they would they would go to the next uh to the next scene and so i use this at the end of these presentations to remind people um you don't have film you're not going to be shooting with film uh unless you're like super super hipster um, I doubt any of you will be. I, uh, I think that um, the the action or the the lesson here can still be applied, and that is that after you've shot something, it's really really helpful or beneficial to go back to to open up the camera app to look at the clip on your phone and make sure that it recorded the way that you intended for it to. Uh, it, many, many videos have been ruined because somebody thought they were recording when in fact they were not, and they hit the record button as they went to put their phone in their pocket. <laughs> and they go and they say, oh, I got this awesome clip out there today, and check this out, and they realize that when they thought they were pushing stop, after recording an amazing clip, they actually were pushing record for the first time because they didn't when they thought they did. And then they recorded the inside of their pocket for an hour and a half. This has happened uh, to probably anybody that uh, regularly uses their smartphone to record video. It happens to me um, still to this day. And so it's important to check the gate, quote unquote, with your smartphone, pull up the clips that you've shot, make sure that they recorded the way that you thought that they did. Uh, Pull up the clips to check the quality. If it looks like garbage on your phone, Uh, It's going to look like garbage if somebody tries to use it in a presentation or in a video as well. Um, So if the lighting doesn't seem quite right, if if it's too dark, uh, do that trick that I showed you where you hold the the, the, your finger down on, 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 on the spot that is maybe brightest in your scene and, and lock the exposure or actually a even advanced tip. Once you've done that, once you hold your finger down, you can slide your finger up or down to change the exposure manually which would allow you to record uh, maybe a a clip a little bit darker if it was too bright or a clip a little bit brighter if it was too dark. Check to make sure the length of the clip was appropriate. Did you record for 15 seconds like like we talked about or or did you uh, accidentally record the clip for only two or three seconds, which is probably gonna be too short. Um, Check to make sure the movement was appropriate. Um, Did you forget to stabilize and and you can see a lot of movement, the hand shakiness in the shot. Um, All these things that you can see if you just check your footage, check the gate, so to speak, will tell you whether or not you've gotten the the quality of clips using the the tips and tactics that I've talked about today. It will ensure that when you go to send the clips uh, to whoever is is going to be using them uh, or when you share them yourself, uh, you've got the, the top quality available. You can can always, if you're on site still, you can always go back and record something again um, if you if you've messed up. Uh, most of the time, you know, sometimes you get that one opportunity and then that's it. But, but the majority of the time when we're out recording on, on sites, um, we, we can get uh, a second shot if we, if, we, if we realize that the one that we thought we had wasn't really the, the best. But, you know, once you've left a job site or once something has been changed, it's two or three days later and maybe the opportunity is, is no longer available, um, that's a little late to be finding out that, uh, that the clips didn't record the way that you thought that they did. So that is the end of the video recording tips, tactics, tricks, all those good things. Um, and really, now we have about 10 minutes uh, for questions if, if you guys have got any. Rocky, I'm wondering, there are 17 people here. I'm wondering if the best way to do questions would be to just have them typed into the 
uh, chat feature. Is, are you okay with that? I'm okay with whatever people are comfortable with. If you uh, if you okay. want to type that into the chat, I can certainly open that up. Um, and then uh, if you prefer to turn on your mic, you're welcome to do that too. Hey, since since I'm already on, um, I'm going to go ahead and ask if you have any advice uh, for recording narration. Absolutely. So, uh, like what we talked about here mostly was yeah, the visuals, right? And and not the narrative of talking about what's happening. Um, I think the number one point of advice th that I have is uh, to first go back to that purpose and question, do I need narration for these clips at all? Um, now, I'll give you a, an example of, of a case where you wouldn't and a, and a case where you would. If you know that the video clips are going to be edited into a video that's going to have a voiceover later, or if it's going to be included in a presentation where somebody's going to be uh, talking over the top of the clip, then it's not important to, to provide narration or talk while you're recording at all. You can, but it's not really necessary. Um, and then on the contrary, let's say that you were planning on recording a, a 15 to 30 second clip explaining what's happening in a shot and you're just going to post it right on social media or you're just going to share it with people right, right away. In that case, it actually would be very advantageous to have the narration to talk while you're recording because then you've got it all in one clip. You've got a nice 15, 20 second, 30 second clip that's got the visual and it's got you talking. Um, a couple of, of tips about how to actually do that. If you are uh, recording, if you're holding your phone um, or if you have it on a tripod or you've stabilized it somehow and you're still nearby, you're within a, a foot or two of your phone, you can talk uh, at a normal volume or maybe a little bit of an elevated volume. I, I'm, I'm at a little bit of an elevated volume right now as I'm presenting. You use your presenting voice, if you will, um, and, and your phone will pick up your audio pretty well. Um, our, our microphones are getting better and better on, on, on our phones. Um, they're not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. I, I've got a dozen microphones ranging from $30 to you know, hundreds of dollars um, in, our, in our lineup of equipment that all would be significantly better than the microphone that comes on your phone. But it's not always practical for you to carry one of those things around or plug it in and use it, especially... I mean, goodness, with the way the phones are changing, I, 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 don't, I, I constantly am reminded that my phone doesn't have a headphone jack, which would be where I would plug in a microphone as well um, now that I've got the newest version of, of iPhone. So it's a little bit of a pain to use peripheral mics. Um, I think the other option to, to consider or to think about is um, that remember your narration and your visuals can be used independently, can be used separately if someone is going to be editing the content. So oftentimes what I will do, uh, I'll take a family vacation uh, video, for example, uh, I will record a bunch of video clips of my kids doing something. And then later I'll take my phone and I'll use the audio recording tool or the voice memo uh, on iPhone. I'll use the, the voice memo tool to just record a little narration of my voice talking about what, what was happening, what I did today. Uh, and, and you can actually use that then separately. Somebody who's got some editing software can take, uh, you can even do it in PowerPoint. You can take uh, the, the audio clip that you recorded with your voice memo, combine it with several video clips, and you've got an even higher quality and even more purposeful um, sort of combination of, of narration and, and video clips. The one thing I would be careful or, or I wouldn't do is I wouldn't just sort of... Um, casually walk around and talk for minutes at a time showing uh, what you're seeing on screen and, uh, and and then talking over the top of it. Uh, that It's hard for you to decide then what you're, you're, you're sort of forcing yourself to do a lot of mental gymnastics where you're, 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 you're thinking about what you're going to say and you're also supposed to be thinking about what you're filming and making sure that looks good and it's not boring and it's not too long and it's just a lot to do at once. So if you are going to talk while you're filming, I would make sure you do it in little spurts and think about what you're going to say ahead of time. So set it up on the tripod. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be rehearsed. You don't have to sound like, you know, M you know Morgan Freeman voiceover or anything. But just think about, you know, here we've got an example of blank, 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 and then be done. 
turn the camera off, now you've got a 10 to 15 second clip and you've got 10 to 15 seconds of you saying what it is. I also will comment here, um, Jill asked the question, can you mute or remove narration from a video later if someone else would want to use the video another way? And the answer is absolutely. There are some pretty easy ways to do that. Um, there was audio, in fact, on all the video clips that I showed uh, in the presentation today. I know I only showed a couple, but um, there was audio on those. Um, I was able to take that audio off. Uh, most tools that you use, including PowerPoint or video editing uh, software tools, will allow you to remove the audio. Now, keep, one thing to keep in mind, though, is it's all or nothing. So if there's something happening, if there's a water moving through or if there's construction equipment or if there's just natural sound, we call it nat sound or natural sound happening and you're talking over it and we decide we need to remove your voice, unfortunately the nat sound has to go too, which is sort of sometimes sometimes a bummer. I think somebody's yeah somebody got I'm their we're mic on. We're somebody's got the their mic on but we can't hear you well enough so if you're trying to ask a question um, you might need to take yourself off Bluetooth or or something like that because we can only hear a little garbling <laughs> so anybody else have other questions you can put in the chat uh, or or try your mic Tim. Um was going to jump in and just talk quickly and I think maybe post a link about um, uh, a bit of the equipment that some of the folks have. Tim, you want to do that? Sure. Um, do I need to take over presenter? Or do you have something on screen you want to show? No, just uh, I guess. Oh, no. Uh, you're, you're, you're yeah, let, let me stop. Yeah, let me stop presenting. And then, oh, perfect. Yeah, there you go. So uh, we, uh, we being the Ed Committee, uh, purchased three um, DJI Osmo 3 uh, gimbals, and um, it uses your phone, um, and you put it in the gimbal device, and it stabilizes and allows you to do a lot of smooth movement which can, you know, add to the, the basic techniques that um, uh, Rocky talked about in the beginning. It really is good for just um, stabilizing the basic shaking that you do. And if you do movement, it makes it really buttery smooth. Um, the, it pairs with your phone. You download um, their app and you pair through Bluetooth. And it turns your camera into, uh, gives you all the advanced features on screen so that you can go in and manipulate several different things. And it's got some really advanced stuff. So first off, you're going to have to get used to just setting up the device and how to use it and play around and shoot in your backyard, your dog, your kids, just so that you can get familiar with it if you do use it. And then um, there are several tutorials online. I'll go ahead and post a link here in just a minute on one or two. Um, and it's a, again, it's the uh, DJI is the big um, drone manufacturer, and they've taken that drone technology and put it in the handheld device. The model is Osmo 3, and uh, just Google that, and there's lots of tutorials out there on how to do different shots and so um, that's the best recommendation get used to the device how to use it what it does and play with it before you go out in the field because that's not the time to be learning so good point and yeah i think just to reiterate and to kind of tie that device back to all the different things that i talked about today that device um especially it's sort of a an all-in-one in, in a lot of ways so if you get used to using that device um, it's useful for movement uh, like like Tim is saying you know getting getting really buttery smooth movement I love that uh, description buttery smooth Tim <laughs> and uh, also though frankly if you just want to stand there with it and hold it it's sort of in that sense uh, replicates the the functionality of a tripod you know because you can have just a still shot 
And at that point, it, yeah, it's going to completely remove uh, any movement from your hand shaking or, or anything like that. And it's going to look practically like you've set it on a tripod. So it's a really nice all-in-one device. It gives you a lot of different uh, ways of inc- incorporating movement or not movement to your to your video. Rocky, I think you were pretty thorough. <laughs> That's, I've, I've been called worse. Cool. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, You noticed during the whole presentation that I had, um, you know, Rocky Walls and 12 Stars Media down at the bottom of the the screen. Uh, I'm on Instagram and and, and Facebook and all that good stuff. So that if you're on those places and you want to connect with me, you're welcome to. Um, You can connect with uh, me and our company. Uh, You'll see a lot of the kinds of clips um, that that we talk about recording and, and posting. You'll see those on our on our on our channels. Um, and so you're also welcome to reach out to me directly anytime. I don't have a tremendous uh, amount. I'm not like even near capacity on people that I'm happy to just talk to and answer questions or, (laughs) or help. Um, so don't feel bad if you just want to reach out and say, Hey, I I had a question or, or, Hey, I shot this video clip. What did you think of it? Um, you know, how could I do better? Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions like that at all. So it's great. Cool. Well, thanks, everybody, for coming along.